and uh, welcome everyone who uh, sort of filters in as we go through here. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, have Renee Vidal here to uh, give our One World uh, Mind Seminar this week. Um, professor Vidal is the Herschel Theater Professor of Biomedical Engineering and the inaugural director of the Mathematical Institute for Data Science um, at Johns Hopkins University, the, uh, the most distinguished and original minds, I, I should say. Um, his uh, highly influential and award-winning research includes work in machine learning, uh, computer vision, dynamical systems, robotics, and image and signal processing. Uh, over the course of his career to date, he has co-authored over 200 research articles and two books, uh, served as an editor for seven journals, and been the program chair for numerous leading international conferences in computer science and engineering. Um, I'm really happy that he accepted our invitation, and I'm looking forward very much to hearing him, uh, hearing him talk today. So, Renee, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you, Mark. It's a real pleasure to be speaking in the One World Minds uh, seminar today, and I'm very delighted, so I really much appreciate uh, your invitation. Uh, I think it's, we all know that uh, deep learning has taken uh, data science um, over, over the past decade or so. Uh, we've seen incredible successes of deep learning in a great variety of applications, beginning with uh, computer vision, speech, uh, games, uh, moving into robotics. And uh, when a method uh, that uh, appears to be working so well, I think it's very important to, uh, to think how, why. Why is it the case that deep learning is, is working so well? So um, for those of us who are interested in theoretical aspects of machine learning, uh, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to bring together a variety of different fields to study key fundamental questions in the understanding of deep learning. In particular, uh, if I were to think about what are the three broad areas uh, within the theory of deep learning, I think uh, many of us would agree that one of them is uh, approximation theory and its connections with architectural design. In particular, uh, it is true that deep learning has been incredibly successful, but this has been achieved by trial and error in a variety of architectures that are particularly suitable to those applications. So convolutional architectures have been really good for imaging problems, but how would you design an architecture for a new problem for which you don't have one that is working? So this means, well, we need to understand how many layers, uh, the role of depth versus width, and so on and so forth. And these questions were naturally studied in mathematics and approximation theory in the 80s. There are all of these universal approximation results for shallow networks. But the extension of those to deep networks is, is an active area of research today. A second uh, very important question in the theory of deep learning is the question of optimization. Uh, many machine learning problems are convex and we can leverage uh, convex optimization techniques for finding the minima. But a key challenge with deep networks is that uh, we are solving optimization problems over uh, million variables, uh, maybe, uh, and they're highly non-convex. And so uh, we have no guarantees of finding those uh, global minimizers. And so the question of, can we study the landscape? Uh, do we know uh, whether there are many local minima or only a few? Or uh, how do we optimize? Because the problems are so large, then uh, first order methods have become the norm which are maybe the simplest optimization methods. And so why do they converge? Why do they find blue good uh, minimizers? Uh, why stochastic methods seem to be working better maybe than non-stochastic methods? It's, it's one of the other mysteries. Uh, and third, and this is maybe the most important questions for those of us in machine learning, uh, we want to understand why uh, deep networks generalize. What that means is that we train the algorithms on data that is given to us, uh, but we want those algorithms to perform well on new data that is either sampled from the same distribution or from minor variations of the original distribution. So therefore we want to understand how is it that uh, the, the networks trained on few data generalize well. 
Now, I've presented these as if they were three separate problems, uh, but the reality and, and what makes this area very difficult and very interesting is that these three problems are actually intertwined and they cannot be studied in isolation. In particular, for example, if I were to take one of these edges, the connection between architecture and optimization, it appears to be the case, and there are many uh, papers already beginning to show so, that uh, the difficulty of the optimization problem is highly related to uh, the complexity of the architecture, in that in various ways, larger architectures appear to be easier to optimize than smaller ones, and in particular, wide architectures appear to uh, be easier to optimize, and that may be related to uh, the fact that the landscape uh, becomes easier. A second question is uh, the relationship between architecture and generalization. One would expect that you know, bigger architectures are more expressive and they can uh, be used for solving more complex problems. Uh, but we are currently in a situation where the architectures have become really, really, really large and uh, they are able to perform very well even though they are trained with uh, very limited data. And so understanding that interplay between architecture and generalization is, is another question. And uh, I hope to convey the idea that uh, it is not just approximation theory, uh, because approximation theory would say how well I can approximate a function, but it will not have statistical properties about how that will generalize to new samples from the same distribution. And the third aspect, and this is maybe the focus of uh, today's presentation, uh, is really the interplay between optimization and generalization. So the key uh, question and the million dollar question today appears to be, why is it that these machines generalize so well, even though we are training them with uh, a very limited number of examples? So this question of generalization, of course, has been studied and has a long history in uh, machine learning. But if you think about you know, the simplest results maybe for linear classifiers, what is the number of training examples that is needed to train a linear classifier? So our rule of thumb is that it's roughly quadratic in the dimension. And if you think about uh, training deep networks for images where the dimensions might be pixels, a quadratic in the dimension might require you know, a million squared. Dimension could also be uh, the number of weights. So again, if we are thinking about 100 million weights that need to be trained. So it's clear that we don't have you know, 100 million square training examples for many of these applications. So why making networks bigger means that they generalize better and we don't overfit? It, it's very, uh, a very difficult and very interesting and, and timely question. So the conventional wisdom as to why that might be happening, it's really that uh, unlike classical machine learning that we were solving convex problems, these problems are non-convex. And so as illustrated here, you could be in a situation where you've got many global minima, and you could be in a situation, particularly in the overparameterized case, that there is an entire valley uh, where the, the loss function is completely flat. And so what that means is that when you're doing training, uh, depending on how you initialize, depending on which optimization method you use, could be converging to a different uh, minima. And different minima may, uh, are all equivalent if you are thinking uh, only from the perspective of optimization, but different minima might have very different generalization properties. And so the question is why maybe random initialization with stochastic gradient descent might actually find minima that generalize well. And so explaining some of these uh, algorithms and uh, what they are actually doing uh, is uh, one of the fundamental questions. And the answer appears to be that they are performing some sort of implicit uh, bias, some sort of implicit regularization, namely somehow these algorithms prefer some solutions to others and magically the solutions they prefer generalize better. So in this presentation in particular, I'm going to be focus, uh, focusing on one particular uh, algorithm called Dropout and trying to explain what it does. So Dropout was proposed back in uh, 2014 uh, and it was really proposed as a heuristic. Uh, I'll explain what it actually does in a moment. 
Um, and the first time I saw it, I was like, well, why is this even a valid method? Uh, why is it a good optimization method? Why is it generalizing well? And uh, so that motivated uh, my students to, to look into it and try to understand what are the properties of, of this method. But as a matter of introduction uh, and to introduce the notation, uh, this is a neural network. Uh, the input here is going to be denoted by X. So X could be, for example, an image. Then uh, there is a linear transformation that is denoted here by W1. And, and W1 denotes, uh, for example, is a matrix that contains all the weights that transform that input X from the uh, first layer into the second layer. Typically, there is also uh, some sort of nonlinearity that is applied uh, at the second layer. And then there is, again, a second layer that is linear again with weights W2 and another nonlinearity. And deep networks have many such layers. So you can imagine that there might be hundreds of these layers. Uh, and it's really an alternation of uh, linear transformations followed by nonlinearities. So I'm denoting the entire map of the network uh, from the input to the output via this map phi that therefore uh, depends on the input data x, but also depends on the weights w. So uh, it's classical, this is well known. The problem of learning the parameters of this network from training examples is an optimization problem. So what's written here is uh, that I would like to compare the output of the network, phi of xj. xj is a particular input, so imagine the jth image in your data set. And you want to compare that output of the network to some given labels. So think about classification. So yj might be 0 or 1 if it is a binary classification problem. And you do that comparison with some loss. And what you're doing here is to minimize the average loss over your trying entire uh, training set, which is meant to be a surrogate for the expected loss over your entire population. And um, <clears throat> the uh, method uh, of choice, or the simplest method of choice, I should say, uh, things that are done today are more sophisticated than this, is to apply uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, the reason why uh, you use something like stochastic gradient descent is because the number of training examples might be millions, and so computing this gradient uh, has some costs, and so uh, it was really computational efficiency. And in stochastic gradient descent, what you do is that rather than uh, computing the exact gradient over all your training examples, you randomly select uh, what is known as a mini batch, uh, which is a small fraction of examples and denoted here by beta. And uh, you only compute the gradient or the average gradient over that mini batch and you use that to update your weights. And this, uh, the specific implementation of uh, gradient descent is known as backpropagation in machine learning. And the interesting observation is that the gradient can be computed in an efficient manner in the sense that there is a forward pass that is just the evaluation of the map of the network. And there is a backward pass that is nothing but the chain rule that allows you to start at the top and compute the gradients with respect to the weights um, backwards. And so that's why it's called the forward backward pass. It's just a way of computing the gradient. Okay, so that's classical, that's well known, that's the basic notation. So what is happening in dropout? In dropout, what happens is that at every iteration, you randomly select a fraction of the neurons in the network. So they are denoted here by those crosses. Uh, so let's say half of them. So half of those neurons, and you drop them. Uh, what it means to drop them is that, uh, say, the value of or the response of the neuron uh, is set to zero. And so what that means in terms of the uh, gradient descent algorithm or gradient descent with mini batches, if you want, is that uh, if you wish, there is a Bernoulli random variable that with some probability is on or off. And so <clears throat> in the forward pass, uh, instead of computing it as usual, you will set some of the neuron responses to zero. So that's why the forward pass now, it's not only a function of your input and your weights, but also of some random variable, these Bernoullis. And then uh, when it comes to the gradient updates, you're also only going to update the weights that corresponds to neurons that have not been dropped. So 
every single entry, the derivative with respect to weight ij will be set to zero if weight ij does not participate, okay? And so that's what I'm denoting here with this weird cross product with the z variables. What I really mean is that entry by entry of all your weights, you either set them to zero or not, depending on whether that neuron is kept on or off, okay? So that's essentially, and in pictures, this really means just the following. At every iteration, I drop this neuron and I update the weights. At the next iteration, I drop another neuron and I update the weights, and so on, so forth, and I keep going. So the first time I saw this is like, why would you do this? Um, and the explanations given in the paper and in various ways sort of intuitive, uh, but there isn't really any theoretical reason as to whether dropping neurons is a valid uh, optimization method uh, or not. And, uh, but the reason why it was proposed and because it was used, it was because it improves the generalization performance of uh, the network. So uh, I think this is a classification problem and uh, the different curves are different uh, performance curves. So imagine this is your classification error on your test set. And uh, basically there is a gap between uh, networks that are trained without dropout versus networks that are trained with dropout. And uh, the question then is why is it the case that changing the algorithm that I use for minimizing identically the same objective, why does that have any effect, right? If this was a convex problem and the optimization method was guaranteed to converge, they would all find uh, to convert to a global minimum, then they would all find the same minimum and therefore the performance should be the same uh, in, in either case. So evidently they're finding different minimizers and the question is why would dropout consistently find better minimizers? Or, or... So <clears throat> that motivates uh, this talk and uh, these are the, the questions that I intend to answer or try to answer at least in, uh, for some simplified models. The first one is, uh, what is Dropout doing? Is it a valid optimization method? And the answer is gonna be that yes, uh, it is not just a heuristic, it is actually a uh, stochastic gradient descent. What is interesting though, and I think this was very surprising, is that it's not stochastic gradient descent for the original objective, which was just the unregularized loss. Instead, it is actually stochastic gradient descent for a modified objective. So in other words, dropout is a valid optimization method, but for a different objective than the one you start. And so the question might be next then, well, what is the objective that dropout minimizes? And the answer is that uh, it actually introduces regularization uh, of the, uh, for the original loss. And the regularization is not just implicit uh, in the sense that the algorithm has some biases and prefers some solutions over others. You can actually write it down analytically, at least for simple models. And uh, it, you can actually show that it's a low rank style regularizer. Even more, I'm gonna show that it's the nuclear norm uh, that is uh, widely used in, in matrix approximation. Uh, Third, uh, you might be interested, well, now that I know that a modified loss is being minimized and I know that there is a low regularization being induced, uh, can I characterize the global minimizer? What, what is the biases that are induced on, on the weights? Uh, and we are gonna show that uh, you can characterize that and you can characterize the global minimizers uh, and there is this notion of balanced weights uh, between the input and the output that is going to show up. And the last point is that even though I've motivated everything just for dropout, and in fact, I should have qualified it as a dropout for uh, linear networks with a single hidden layer, these results can be extended to other more sophisticated forms of dropout, including uh, drop connect, where you're dropping the weights instead of dropping the uh, neurons, or drop block, where you're dropping multiple neurons simultaneously, as you would do, for example, in an image, you want to uh, drop all of the neurons that correspond to a region of the image, as opposed to 
just at random uh, different pixels in the image. And last, uh, we also have extensions of this to uh, deeper networks. Uh, under the assumption that you do drop out uh, just in the last layer as opposed to doing it in every single layer. And so that's essentially the outline of the talk. Uh, and so I'm ready to get started with a description, but if there is a question right now, that would be a, a good time. Uh, yes, I think there's at least uh, one question that uh, someone has. Um, Gimon, if you want to ask your question. Or maybe I'll I'll ask. It's uh, he wanted to know what the uh, what the sort of standard percentage of, of uh, dropout um, nodes are, and whether you can how far you can push it before it stops working. Um, in practice, the um, the typical percentage that is used is about fifty percent. Um, but as the talk will explain, uh, the effect of the uh, probability of the of dropout is that it's going to uh, be related strongly to the weight that you put on the regularizer. So the more you drop out, the more you regularize. And so it's a trade-off parameter that potentially could also be tuned. But okay. for the for the sake of practicality, in most cases, it's usually 50%. Okay, great. And, and in fact, there are even cases, uh, we even have papers that are very practical that suggest that you should vary this. Namely, think about curriculum learning where you want to learn simple things first and then learn more complicated things. There is also work suggesting that you would should begin with a dropout rate that is not uh, very large and increase it throughout training. Those are all a lot of practical work on that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let me begin with uh, the first part of the talk. And of course, my uh, statement here is very hand wavy, but I think it summarizes. So you have to memorize one thing. What I'm going to try to say is that dropout is the nuclear norm square. So let me try to convince you uh, why is that. So just to introduce the notation, we're going to be looking at uh, networks that have a single hidden layer. Uh, X uh, denotes here the input. V is going to be a matrix that denotes the uh, input weights. So N sub I here is the number of inputs. R is the number of hidden layers. So think about this is just a linear transformation. And V is, is the matrix that describes that linear transformation. And so this is written here. So the activations in the hidden layer are Z is just V transpose X. And there are R of them because I've got R neurons in the hidden layer. And then there is a second matrix of weights U uh, that has a number of outputs by number of hidden units. And therefore the input output map is just U V transpose X. Um, and so when you want to train a network like this, uh, we're going to have uh, the matrix of weights. Uh, so actually, this is also notation. So uh, the ith column of V, therefore, contains all the weights corresponding to the ith neuron. And similarly for the ith column of U. So the major distinction is just whether there is input weights versus output weights. And so in terms of the training problem, uh, we are going to do the simplest possible loss. So this is just this uh, L2 squared. And uh, what I want to convey the idea of is that uh, in this particular case of linear networks, this very much looks like a matrix factorization problem. Uh, you give output Y and you want to factorize it as the product three matrices, the output weights U, the input weights V, and the input data matrix X. And so from that perspective, uh, we might just think of uh, dropout in the context of matrix factorization. And so that's exactly uh, what I'm going to do. I'm even going to drop uh, to get rid of the input data and just consider uh, a well-known and well-studied problem uh, in math, which is just factorizing matrices. So here you give me Y and I want to factorize it as the product of UV transfer. And I'm adding no regularization whatsoever. And so I guess this problem is well known. Uh, if, if you think of you being orthogonal, then you would get PCA. And you know that the solution here is obtained with SVD. Of course, that depends on how many columns you put in, in U. 
but the number of columns or the rank of this factorization is going to be the number of neurons in that hidden layer. Okay, so instead of doing that and uh, just uh, to invent temporarily is an invention, uh, but I'm going to invent a problem that maybe you've seen, maybe you've never seen, um, but let me just invent it. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to draw a Bernoulli uh, random variable, one uh, for each one of the hidden neurons. So one, so there are of them. And theta is going to denote the probability that that Bernoulli random variable is on. And so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to inject in the matrix product UV transpose. In the middle of it, I'm going to inject a diagonal matrix with these Bernoulli uh, random variables. And as you know, UV transpose is just the sum of rank one matrices. So what I'm really doing is um, putting this rank one matrix uh, mm -hmm. in uh, the middle there. And so the, sorry, the Z-I. Sorry about that. So the Z-I, as you can see, uh, it's, I've got a matrix product here. And uh, in this matrix product, uh, I'm just dropping a factor. So if Z-I is one, I keep it. If Z-I is zero, I drop it. That's all. For mysterious reasons that are going to become apparent in a moment, I'm going to divide here by theta. That's the probability of dropout. And then because Z is a random variable, I'm going to minimize the expected value with respect to the missing entries and minimize still with respect to U and V, which are the weight or the factors in the matrix factorization. So that's the optimization problem that I'm going to consider. Okay. So, uh, all right, so suppose that you decide to give this optimization problem to one of your graduate students, and so, or you give it as a homework problem in your stochastic optimization class or your matrix analysis class, and you ask them a very basic question. Uh, can you just compute the gradient or can you do gradient descent for this objective as a function of U and V? And so, uh, okay, this is a very messy expression, so I apologize for that, but really all what's being done here is gradient descent. So the new weights, uh, UV, are equal to the previous weights minus the gradient of that objective. And uh, the only thing is that the gradient of the expected value, as here is uh, the expected value of the gradient, so I'm evaluating the gradient only at one sample, Z. Okay, so it's, it's like stochastic gradient. And what is it that's happening? I mean, just look at the expression, even though it's messy. Instead of having the product of U and V, I am injecting these Bernoulli variables in the middle. So in the forward pass, which is just matrix product, I'm dropping out some neurons, okay? Then, in addition, here on the far right, there is this diagonal matrix with the uh, Bernoulli random variable. So this diagonal matrix really is a diagonal matrix with zeros and ones in the diagonal. So uh, if there is a zero in that diagonal entry, that zero is going to multiply the corresponding column of the UV matrix. And remember that the columns of UV are just all of the weights associated with the ith column is all of the weights associated with the ith neuron. So what this means is that in the update, the ith neuron weights are equal to the ith neuron weights plus an update. That update is gonna be zero if the Bernoulli is zero. So in other words, you are not updating the weights corresponding to that neuron. So hopefully this just reminds you, well, this is exactly what the dropout algorithm was doing. In the four pass, you just need to evaluate the map, which in this case is metric multiplication, while setting to zero the entries corresponding to the neurons that, drop, that you're dropping out. And in the backward pass, you need to not update all of the weights corresponding to the neurons that you've dropped out. So this is a simple, therefore, exercise that you can give to any graduate student just to show that, uh, indeed, dropout is a valid algorithm and it's actually minimizing the objective that I have crafted uh, at the very top. So naturally the next question is, well, what is this new objective? Um, and now you can even uh, give that question to an undergraduate student who is just taking Statistics 101. And so uh, because we are looking at the squared uh, loss, uh, this very much looks like the standard 
variance and expectation decomposition that the expected value of the square is equal to the expected value of y squared plus the variance. And so that's exactly what this stochastic objective is doing. And because this is you know, very simple, it's just a Bernoulli and it's linear, computing this expectation is, is really trivial. And so the expected value of the loss squared, which is what I'm trying to do by this formula, is equal to the expected value of what's inside and then squared. And the expected value of what's inside, well, z is a Bernoulli, so the expected value is theta. So that theta cancels with this theta here. So I guess you now understand why I have magically normalized uh, the matrix product by dividing by theta so that now I take the expected value, the theta disappears. And magically, now I get back the original objective, which was just the standard squared loss that I began. And then plus the variance, um, I guess the variance is a little bit more involved to compute. So uh, just believe me that this is the result that you get. But what is the important observation? First, there is some weight here, and that weight depends on the value of the probability theta. In particular, theta is the probability of retaining the random variable. So if theta is one, this means that I retain everything. And so this means that the regularization is gone. So if you retain all of your neurons, then you get back your usual unregularized square loss. Second, as theta becomes smaller and smaller, the regularization weight increases. So that goes back to uh, the question that I was asked earlier, that the more you drop out, the more you regularize. So the next question is, well, what is this extra regularizer that has shown up? So this is the sum from one to R, which is the number of neurons. U sub I is all of the weights, the vector of weights, for the i-th neuron, the output weights, and v sub i is the input weights. So what this is really doing is just taking the norm of all the weights for the output squared times uh, the norm for all the weights for the input squared and sum them, sum them up across all uh, neurons. Or, okay? So now the next question is, well, what, still, what is it? What, why do I want to do sums of products of weights, which is what this regularizer is doing. And so for those of you who have worked in uh, uh, L1 minimization and nuclear norm minimization, uh, you may uh, remember this formula for the nuclear norm. So on the left is the nuclear norm of a matrix, uh, which is the sum of the singular values. And that sum of singular values uh, can be written in a very fancy and complex way uh, as written here. Uh, you give me the matrix X, you factorize it as the product of any two matrices uh, you want, and you minimize the sum of the product of the norms of the columns of U and V as written here. And if you minimize over all choices of U and V and over R, which is the rank or the number of columns, magically you get exactly the nuclear norm. And that's a well-known result and is known as the variational form of the nuclear norm. And so, uh, well, uh, this looks very, very similar uh, between the regularizer that dropout induces and this nuclear norm. The only difference is that you've got the square uh, versus uh, in the nuclear norm, you don't have the square. And so once I saw this, I immediately told the student, well, it has to be the nuclear norm square, what you get there. Uh, and I was talking over dinner with uh, Nati Zeribro and he said, no, 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 it cannot be. Uh, and uh, that, that led to the question, well, can we show whether it is or not? And so if it is, and that was the conjecture, then uh, it would magically simplify a lot of things because this would mean that instead of solving that non-convex problem uh, that dropout is trying to do and implicitly adding this regularizer, it would be equivalent to just solving this convex problem now, where given the matrix Y, I just directly try to approximate it by a matrix X, and then I have a regularizer, which is the nuclear norm squared. And uh, actually this problem can almost be solved in closed form. It's, it's almost like the famous shrinkage thresholding 
And therefore, rather than doing dropout, you could just do this uh, with an SVD and some variant of shrink and stress holding, and you would get actually UV transpose immediately. So it turns out that uh, both uh, Natty and I were right in, in slightly different ways, and I'm going to uh, qualify the statement in a moment. So uh, the, the reason is the following. Actually, the dropout regularizer I've been talking about is not a proper regularizer, and it has a major problem that it does not regularize the rank or the number of columns or the number of neurons as we expect. And a proof, or maybe just a, you know, a cooked example to show that there is a problem is the one uh, that I've got here, where you say the following. Let's pretend that I'm going to double the size of the matrix. Give me a U and give me a V. I'm going to evaluate the regularizer. But now, you know, if this is going to regularize and it is going to be a nuclear norm, if it is going to penalize rank, then it has to be bigger uh, when I make the matrix bigger. Uh, so let's see if that happens. So what I'm doing here is let me double the size of the matrix by just duplicating. So I have U and U. I do the same thing uh, to V, so V and V. And I'm going to put this square root uh, two scaling. The main reason to do that is that I want the product UV transpose to be preserved. So then if this is U tilde and this is V tilde, then U tilde V tilde transpose is the same as UV transpose. So in summary, I'm doubling the size of my matrices, but I'm preserving the product. So that in that loss, the loss remains the same because the product does not change and it's only the regularizer what I'm looking at. And what happens, and you just evaluate this, is that the regularizer is divided by two. So in other words, you double the size of your factorization and your regularization goes down by a factor of two. What that means is that by making my matrix bigger, I don't change the loss and I make the regularizer smaller. And so the optimal factorization would be with an infinite number of columns. I just, I just keep doubling and I keep reducing the object. So, all right, so Nati was right and, and this fails, so it cannot be a nuclear norm squared. But the reality is that um, there are two pieces to the regularizer. One is the, the fancy formula of sum of products of weights, but there is also the factor that goes in front, the regularization weight. And insofar, I have assumed that the regularization weight is constant, like no matter how many neurons, I have the same uh, dropout. So what we're gonna do is, aha, if the regularizer is gonna be half, can I change theta so that it doubles, so that at least I balance them out? And you can easily derive your formula of how the thetas need to be chosen for R neurons versus the theta for one neuron. And what you do is exactly what I just said. The regularizer lambda for R neurons is going to scale linearly with the number of neurons, okay? So what I'm doing now then is drop out, but with a variable rate, namely with a rate that adjusts with the number of neurons. And the more neurons I have, the more I drop out. Okay. So once you do that, well, at least the things are balanced now. If I double the size of the matrices, the regularizer with two R columns has the same value of the regularizer with R columns. So I'm not making things work worse. But still, there is the question of, does this regularize? Like, is it a nuclear norm? Like, OK. And so the answer is yes, and here's finally the correct way to state the proposition, which is that if you minimize not only the sum of the products of the weight squared, which is what you would have usually done, but you scale it by the proper regularization factor, and that regularization factor is also changing with the number of neurons, and it's changing according to that formula, then the minimum of that is exactly the nuclear norm squared scaled by the regularization factor corresponding to one neuron. Okay, and so therefore now you can choose a canonical dropout rate as if you only had one neuron and just adjust it automatically. And then you do get uh, the nuclear norm. And so with that in mind, now everything I have promised that you can actually solve everything in close form uh, is possible. So the, the main theorem here is that 
the global minimum of the dropout objective. And uh, the dropout objective is what is here in this box. So the global minimum of that dropout objective uh, has the following properties. The UV transpose for that global minimum is equal to the shrinkage thresholding of your matrix of labels. And in fact, it's the same global minimum as the global minimum for this convex problem, uh, which is a simple matrix approximation problem regularized with the nuclear norm squared. The only thing, you know, for those of you who are very familiar with nuclear norm without the square, so in that case, you would have done SVD and shrink the singular values with a constant, and the constant is a regularization parameter. Here is a little bit more involved. You need some tau here that depends on the singular values of y. That's the only, uh, the only modification that needs to be done. So it's a little bit more involved, but still is a linear algebraic solution. So with that, I get x, which is the product of UV transpose. And I don't need to, in principle, optimize over u and over v, and I don't need to do dropout. I can just compute the solution to this matrix factorization problem, so to so this matrix approximation problem, and I'm done. All right, so are there any questions uh, now before I move to the next section of the talk? No? Uh, in practice, do the, uh, do the weights in practice that corresponds to nuclear norm minimization um, seem to produce results that are as good as other weight choices? Um, what would be the other weight choices? Uh, so, uh, theta that it doesn't scale in the same way. Ah, so of course there is going to be issues of scalability. I'm not proposing that necessarily we're going to do that. This is just the analysis. If the matrices X or Y here are very, very large, we still prefer to do that. And we still prefer to do stochastic gradients and we still prefer to do drop out. But at least this provides an understanding of what the solution is. Yep, okay. yep, got it. Yep. Uh, and in fact, that's exactly the next question. In the next section, I'm going to do it in the UV space and I'm going to try to characterize what biases are induced on the UV space. Okay. All right. So that's exactly what I just said. Everything I said so far tells us what the optimal product is, but it doesn't tell us what the optimal factors are. Another critique is that I was varying the number of neurons and I was varying the dropout rate. In practice, you know, maybe I'm just given, this is the network architecture, it has so many neurons, just optimize it. Can you understand what is the bias induced by dropout? So we're going to introduce uh, this notion of balance, uh, balance weights. And what does it mean for the weights to be balanced? It really means that you take the weights of the i-th neuron, these are the output weights, you multiply it by the input weights, and uh, balance weight means that those products of weights are the same across all neurons in the hidden layer. Okay, that's a definition that I'm introducing. And a very interesting linear algebra result, which is very surprising, in fact, is that you give me any two matrices, U and V, and you can always transform them into a canonical form where they are balanced. Not only that, you can do that via some rotation. Uh, so given an arbitrary U and V, which is what's stated here, you can always rotate U and rotate V, and you're going to obtain u prime v prime that is now balanced. Okay. And even more, this can be done using modifications. It's a linear algebraic procedure, something like gram schmidt and eigenvalue decompositions and diagonalizations, and it's possible to find those rotations. So anyhow, I repeat the basic concept. I'm defining uh, that two matrices are balanced if the product of the norms of the columns are the same across all columns. And I'm also telling you that given any two matrices U and V, you can always convert them to a situation where they're balanced. So with that, I can state now the result on what is the global optimum look like uh, for the case where the number of columns is fixed. And, um, and this is the result. 
So as before, uh, suppose that you give me Y and you compute the shrinkage threshold in that nuclear norm squared regularized version. Uh, so UV transpose needs to satisfy that. But in addition, uh, so UV is a global minimum, if and only if it is balanced and it is low rank. And not only is low rank, it needs to be this shrinkage threshold inversion of the label. So that provides a complete characterization of uh, the global minimum now in the UV space. And it also provides, and again, I'm not advocating this in the large scale matrices, this is not gonna be the way to go. But for small matrices, what this says the following, forget about dropout, forget about doing your calculations in the factorized space. All you do is give me the matrix of labels, compute the shrinkage thresholding, then factorize it with any factorization you want. And then there is a rotation of U and V that's gonna give you the global optimum of the factorized problem, okay? So let me tell you pictorially what really is happening in this factorized space. And this pictorial um, illustration is gonna be with a super simple uh, networks, one input, one output, and two hidden neurons so that we can actually plot. And so this is a plot uh, of the objective function uh, in the case of these two variables. And there is no regularization, there is no dropout, so this is just the unregularized squared loss. And the main observation that I want you to, to see is that there is a global minimum that is a circle. So th there is an entire valley of global minimizers. So how does the landscape change uh, when I add dropout? All of a sudden, this circle becomes four points. And these four points in this UV space, okay, it's almost like that, but it's kind of plus one, plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, you know, the four corners. Um, and that's exactly what balance means, right? That the product of U and V is the same, okay? And the other effect that I hope you're observing is that the radius, you know, if this was still a circle, the radius is shrinking. And if I increase the dropout rate, it's even smaller, it becomes sharper. So this is exactly saying, uh, or illustrating pictures, the two big messages that I was trying to convey. Number one, that dropout induces regularization and changes the landscape. So you go from uh, a circle of global minimizers to only four. And the other is the low rank effect uh, and balanced effect. So it's low rank and via this shrinkage thresholding, the more you add dropout, the more the solutions shrink uh, towards the origin, right? And then it's balanced in the sense that there is symmetry uh, on all the solutions uh, because the product of the weights uh, needs to be the same for all units. This other picture is now illustrating, um, well, what happens if you do drop out in some matrix, synthetic example with a 120 by 80 matrix. Uh, I use a uh, factorization of size 20. There is different dropout rates. And so this is the uh, doing gradient descent on the expected loss that I was talking about. So this would be the standard uh, gradient descent on the expected loss. The red curve is the global minimum that in this particular case can be computed analytically. And this is simply showing that even though we don't have a proof that gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent or dropout would converge, uh, at least in these examples we've run it, uh, it always finds the global minimum that in this particular case now we can compute. Uh, this is now uh, measuring numerically balance and showing that as iterations of dropout proceed, the solutions are getting more and more balanced. And uh, we measure that by looking at the different neurons, looking at the product of weights, and if all of them are equal, then the variance of that vector that has all the products away should be zero. So this is just plotting that variance as a function of the number of iterations and just showing this is logarithmic scale. And so this is just showing that uh, it's going down and therefore as the iterations of the actual dropout algorithm proceed, the matrix weights of this matrix factorization are becoming more and more balanced. All right, so 
I'm happy to stop here if there are many questions. I think we have only about seven minutes left, uh, but if not, then I'm happy to show how this extends to uh, more complex forms of dropout as well as to deep networks. Mark? Uh, yeah, is, are there any questions that anyone has at this point? I invite... Yeah, I, I have a question. Suppose the circular global minimum was just slightly banked so that the global minimum was on one side, but it still mm -hmm. would be a unimodal function with only one global minimum to where the steepest descent would converge from everywhere. And doesn't this regularization then break up the bottom again into four minima, one, to, one of which would be the global minimizer and the other ones would be local? and you couldn't get out of those local catchments? Um, so I don't know uh, precisely the answer to your question because you begin your question by saying, suppose that the loss had this shape. And the reality is that all the results that I've been mentioning pertain uh, this particular loss, which is the square loss on this particular uh, problem where you're measuring the error between Y and UV transpose. So whether the situation that you're describing can happen, uh, I'm not sure. And in particular, I think uh, the style of problems that I was thinking about or that I think this fits is, again, the R is maybe sufficiently large and you do have valleys of global minimizers. So, um, so I don't know necessarily that what you're describing would happen a priori. And I apologize that I don't have a better answer. Well, that, but that's a potential negative effect one would want to avoid or show that it can't show up. I mean, it's just a- That you can increase the number of, uh, that you can increase the number of minimizers by adding the regularization. Well, I mean, my worry is that if you do a slight linear shift on this image uh, and then do your regularization, you would split up and generate several, because that depends on the coordinates. I mean, this, this uh, thing is rotation invariant, the way it looks. Yes. So once you got this yes. depends on the coordinates, then you do the regularization, you introduce four local minimizer where there was this ring Ah. And if the ring was slightly banked, uh, they wouldn't all have the same value anymore. And then if you got stuck near one of the non-global ones, you couldn't get across anymore. Now, whether or not this slight linear bank can come about through the model, I, I, I don't see either. Yeah. Uh, so uh, again, I'm not so sure it, it can happen. And so to, to answer more precisely to what you said, uh, indeed, there is rotational invariance in the loss, um, but the regularizer is rotational invariant on the left, but not on the right. And this, uh, the idea of balancing that I was talking about is precisely finding the rotation that eliminates that symmetry. So, I, I think to be able to answer your question, we will really need to sit down and, and do the analysis to see whether that can happen. But I think my answer is uh, so far is that I'm talking here about particular losses and particular regularizers that have particular uh, invariance properties that are being exploited to get the results. So I'm not so sure that, that the situation that you're describing can happen. But, but, I'm, but I have not thought about it deeply to, to be sure about my answer either. Yeah, any, uh, any other questions from other audience members or um, organizers? If you would uh, rather ask them by chat, that's also a possibility. Okay, so in that case, it seems like if you would like to continue a little bit longer, you have a little bit more time. Um, Great. Yes. So I'll, I'll try to be brief. I have many more slides than, than the time I have left, but let me just uh, try to convey, convey the very high level ideas. 
The first point is that beyond dropout, there's been many other variants that people have proposed. So instead of dropping neurons, you can drop the edges. Um, but then you could decide to drop many neurons simultaneously and together, particularly think about images and you want to drop uh, for convolutional networks in particular, you might want to uh, drop all of the neurons that correspond to the same filter size, for example, altogether. So uh, the gist of the results that I would like to present very briefly is that this is what you already saw. This is what Dropout does. So it adds an extra regularizer that I showed. It was equal to the nuclear norm squared or, or at least the, the convex envelope of it. So the, the major difference when you're dropping multiple things simultaneously is that instead of having columns of the matrices that correspond to a single neuron, now you actually have matrices that correspond to all of the neurons at the same time. And so the two norm of the columns gets replaced by the Frobenius norm. But the structure of the problem and, and the derivations are very, very similar, except that instead of having vectors, I have matrices corresponding to the block that is being dropped. The next uh, result is that instead of getting the nuclear norm squared, uh, you get this regularizer. And this regularizer, again, going back to the left, X is a matrix. And what you see on the right is sum of the singular values squared. That is the first term. And the second term is sum of the singular values and then squared. And so this is something like um, the elastic net, if you wish, on the singular value space in the sense that is the sum of a, a term that is the standard L2 squared and another one that is the L1 squared. So it's not the elastic net either because the elastic net doesn't have the square. But it's a trade-off, I think, between the Frobenius norm squared for the matrix and the nuclear norm squared. Uh, and the trade-off is controlled by this uh, R. So indeed, um, if the optimal R in this problem is one, then you get the nuclear norm squared. And that happens by necessity in the dropout case. But as the optimal R is equal to the size of the block, then uh, you get the Frobenius norm square regularization. So that, so, and this, no, this is a well-known norm. It has a name, is the spectral R support norm. So that was the extension to dropout. The third, very quickly again, is we have extended the notion of balanced. And before it was the product of the weights need to be the same across all neurons. Now you do this is the product of the weight across blocks needs to be the same. I'm going to go very quickly, but I think the idea is very intuitive that in other words, I think everything that's happening is the same results I talked about so far generalize and instead of applying to individual neurons, now they apply to the blocks. And the major difference is nuclear norm is replaced by R support norm. Um, okay, it can be extended in other ways. You can become really fancy and now instead of having Bernoulli random variables that are all IID, you can put a covariance structure on your dropout variables and then you can go through the same calculations that I did and, and derive a formula. So here it is. So you can also derive um, a uh, loss that this structured and or generalized dropout method is, is doing and you can there are, there is a closed form formula again for uh, the regularizer as a function of the covariance of the Bernoulli random variables sorry that I'm going this fast um, and so the and this, this is just to show that now that I have this generalization the vanilla dropout case is a particular case and the drop block is another particular case. So everything emerges now from this very general framework that allows for structured dropout to be applied. So anyhow, let me stop there. I think in summary, what are the big messages? Uh, the big message is that there is a very nice interplay between optimization and generalization and that modifying the way in which you optimize uh, deep networks uh, modifies the solutions that you obtain and that there are many tricks that seem to be leading to very good solutions from a generalization perspective. One of those tricks is dropout, which was originally proposed as a heuristic. And the main contribution of this work is to analyze what dropout does. And the main contributions are 
to show that it's a valid uh, optimization method, that is stochastic gradient descent, that it induces uh, low rank regularization in the sense of minimizing the number of neurons in that hidden layer, that the optimal weights end up being balanced, and that these results can be extended uh, from vanilla dropout to more sophisticated versions, uh, including drop connects uh, and drop block. Thank you very much.